Hello, you're watching News Click, and today we're going to be talking about the situation in Palestine and West Asia in general as Israel's brutal attacks on Gaza continue. Now, the focus of these attacks for the past week or so has been the northern part of Gaza. Reports say that at least 200 people have been killed. There is a clear ground invasion that is taking place. The humanitarian situation there is extremely bad. Of course, Israeli attacks also continue on Lebanon. The whole of the region continuing to be in a situation in a massive crisis of various dimensions there's of course humanitarian but also at a geopolitical level at an economic level we'll be talking about all this with Prabir Prakash sir. Prabir thank you so much for joining us. So uh, first of all uh, we have crossed of course the one year uh, you know one year since the Israeli uh, attacks began and at various points there have been talks of ceasefire Israel has of course uh, never really followed up on any of that in fact it seems to have amped up its brutality and in recent times we've seen those visuals of an attack on the hospital which led to at least four people dying very brutal uh, visuals of the hospital catching fire for instance and time and again uh, it does seem like especially with northern Gaza right now the indication is, and media reports from Israel also say that, that there is a very clear, uh, there seems to be an attempt to in fact occupy at least a portion of that region, remove as many Palestinians as possible. So what do you, you know, what, how do you make, what do you make of the situation right now? Well, let's also look at the background of how this started, the attack by Hamas on, on Israel. And that's what they say is the prime cause of it. Of course, they don't talk about the continued occupation of Gaza and the West Bank which they should have, by various accords they have signed, should have allowed them to go free. But leaving that out, there's also the hostage issue, which Israel doesn't seem to be at the moment interested in, because it wants to use it to rally the people inside Israel to its task of the agenda of what you said, uh, subjugating Gaza completely. Mm -hmm. In the process, if they can't displace the whole of Gaza, which they wanted to, at least the northern part of uh, Gaza and vacate it and force it to go, you know, to more towards the south, and that part then becomes another part which they then occupy. Along with it, also the attacks on Lebanon have taken place, and let's not forget in the background of it, there is an Israel-Iran issue that is also there, and with Iran striking Israel after it had said that if you do what you have done and you continue to do it, there will be a reaction. There indeed was after. Of course, uh, Ismail Haniyeh's uh, assassination in Iran, in the, uh, Tehran, and the various other attacks, including uh, Hassan Nasrullah's assassination and the brutal bombing of Beirut. So right. all of these is the background. But the real issue right now is one of it in humanitarian terms is really Gaza. And you also focused on that. But I think in strategic terms, it's really Lebanon. And of course, in much larger context in global terms, it's what happens if Iran and Israel go to war. And it's also clear that Israel is not going to go to war by itself. It is going to war, right. go to war backed completely with the United States. So the larger geostrategic issue is why is the US not doing anything to stop this war? And how does it help the United States to have the kind of conflagration which is possible if there's an Iran-Israel war, the whole region can go up, the, if the oil facilities can be attacked. Iran has said if any of the countries like Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates participate by allowing Israeli uh, aircraft to cross or missiles to cross their territory, then they would consider them also as a party to the assault. So all of this is really very bad news for the globe in general because it means then, uh, apart from the West Asian crisis, which has nuclear dimensions, also the possibility of a global oil crisis. And all of this, it's strange to see that the United States who control the arms supply to Israel, the financial resource of Israel, who has the ability to stop this if they want, are not willing to do anything to the account except make noises that, oh, we really want peace and so on. But they are they have just put a third battery over there, right. which is basically, again, trying to protect it from an Iranian missile attack if it happens in the future. But they don't seem to be at all willing to pull back Israel. And they pretend as if Israel is not listening to them. 
which is un unbelievable because the weapon supply is coming from there, the missiles are coming from there, the ammunition is coming from there, the bombs are coming from there, and of course the money is uh, really coming from there. To say Israel is not listening to us doesn't make logical sense. So the question really is for all of us, why is the United States not willing to stop what is really a multidimensional crisis which has global implications implications for all of us at the moment. Right, and uh, I think 20, 20 million dollars worth of arms supplies have gone to Israel in the past one year. 20 alone. billion. Uh, 20 billion, sorry, uh, which, is, which itself is a major record. I think it's been unprecedented. But actually coming back to your question, I think it's uh, of uh, importance, like you said, not only to the region but across the world. And in some senses, I think the key point from that is that what does the United States uh, want from this kind of a scenario? So one question is that uh, is uh, is this does the strategy seem to be to sort of egg Iran on to a war or onto an invasion and then uh, look for achieving what seems to have been a long term aim for both sections of the U.S. political establishment? Iran is not going to invade anybody. Right. You know the only people who are invading at the moment is Israel. Exactly. So the question is, if Israel launches a missile strike on Iran, then what is going to happen is a question. Right. But before we get into that, I would also ask the following question which I think is there in everybody's mind. Why is the United States not willing to pull Israel back? When you, as you have said, 20 billion arms, financial aid, you know, it's really impossible to conceive that without US air and missile support, mm -hmm. they can think of attacking Iran without, you know, the strike taking out their uh, the fertilizer plant, which is very close to Tel Aviv, or the Dibona nuclear reactor. So all of these, if they go, go up in a missile attack, then of course it makes Israel's, uh, for Israel it's a huge issue, because it is going to mean a large area, Dibona reactor means a large area becoming possibly polluted with radioactive uh, material. And the fertilizer plant, as you know, if it goes up, the ammonia leakage, etc., would take its toll, a huge toll in terms of people affected, killed, and so on. So it's not possible for Israel to do what they're doing without knowing that the United States will support us whatever we do. As we saw in the Iran's military strike, which they did, this time with 180 missiles, they did not give uh, any prior notice. It seems that the US was told two hours before it, or the new two hours before the strike, to that, that extent, the, uh, the base, the, the, the air bases did not seem to have on the ground aircraft. But we have seen that there are at least 32 missile hits that, that the, uh, the air base took, and that is well documented by now. To, therefore, it is also clear that Israel's missile shield, which is a three-layer one, one is the first is the, which is really the one which is supposed to uh, catch the low. Iron Dome. Iron Dome is supposed to catch the low uh, flying missiles, the ones which the uh, Hamas have used, and they can stop those. Then you have the next level, which is David Slick. That, of course, uh, catches the next level which could be uh, long distance missiles, including ballistic missiles. Ballistic missiles are very difficult to stop. Then there is a third layer also, which is there, which is part of it is a third uh, batteries could be a part of it. But all of this, the fact that Iran could break that and strike shows that Iran has the capability and they have a capability which is much larger run, uh, number of missiles. Forget Iran, at the moment, Hezbollah has hit a military base Four of the Israeli soldiers have died, 57 are injured. So it's not a small attack, it has taken a large toll. And in the attack on Lebanon, though they have caused huge casualties in terms of bombing of Beirut, therefore civilian casualties in uh, Nasrullah's assassination, they killed 300 uh, civilians as well because those houses, high-rise apartments were brought down with bunker buster, buster bombs. And this kind of civilian casualties are mounting. 25% of Lebanese population have been asked to vacate or have already vacated 
the areas which Israel says are not safe for civilians. That's 25 percent of Lebanon's population. So Lebanon is squarely in the crosshairs, but it is also clear that Hezbollah has seen that they have been able, able to penetrate only about two kilometers beyond the border. I'm going by what the international agencies are saying, that no serious incursion has taken place. So it's still a missile war attack on various uh, centers in which the thing, uh, the Hezbollah is there. But in terms of physical engagement, Israel seems to have also lost materials, seem to have lost people, and the Hezbollah's uh, Missile attacks still continue. And the fact that they have been effective, they have been hit Haifa, they have hit Tel Aviv, and they have hit military camps, military bases, all seem to show that this is not going to be a cakewalk as you think. Right. So this is one part of the, you know, the scenario. The question that I think we need to ask is why is the world not able to stop uh, Israel's this kind of open flouting of the United Nations, the attack on the United Nations, peacekeepers, pe peacekeepers, all of it, why is it not able to stop? And what is the Western world? Those who say we are the keepers of global peace, we are the uh, ones who have set the global rules of engagement. What is it called? Rules-based Rule -based international right. orders. Yeah. Why does the rule-based international order, hmm. willing to accommodate what is clearly emerging as a rogue state, interested in, in involved in genocide, genocidal violence against the Palestinian people as well as Lebanese? Right. Uh, that's a complete collapse of institutions and <clears throat> uh, the kind of I think political uh, the cowardice is not really the word for that. Involved that uh, implies there's an intention to actually stop it. And you pointed out that. At least in the global West, global North, Western countries, there's clearly no intention to stop it. But I also wanted to ask you about the so-called axis of resistance. You have Iran, uh, you know, Hezbollah, we have the Houthis, we have the resistance groups in Iraq, for instance. So for them right now also, it's… And uh, Syria as well. And Syria as well. <clears throat> so for them right now as well, it's a bit of a challenging position. They have suffered a couple of hits in recent times, there's no denying that. Nonetheless, like you said, they have managed to resist, especially in Lebanon and for that matter, in Palestine, they've managed to resist in various ways. So as far as they're concerned, what do you see as the options ahead, uh, you know, ahead for them, especially uh, with respect to Iran? Because it has fired, it has fired some missiles. It has clearly sent a message, but uh, definitely Israel seeking to call, uh, escalate and look at any way to sort of provoke even more responses from Iran to then cite that as a reason for, you know, to escalate further. Well, the problem that Israel has that the fact that Israeli counter-missile uh, weapons shield did not work means that if Iran now uses more serious weaponry, what's going to happen? Second, as it's also now clear, the drones are not really easy to stop. In fact, the military base which was hit, which led to four deaths and 57 injured people. In fact, it was a drone attack. It was not a missile attack. That's also one of the things that the Houthis showed, that the drones are difficult to stop. And therefore, if the war moves towards the use of drones, particularly on civilian areas, mm. yes, Israel has the ability to bomb using bunker busters, big ammunition, missiles on various uh, targets. But how do you stop these small things from getting in and also then taking down, causing serious damage? So I think if it is the issue of Iran, uh, I think Iran has enough, plus the Houthis, plus Syria, plus Iraq, they have support, all of this, then, and if United States decide to participate with uh, Israel, then I think you are going to see a much larger conflagration, much larger battle that will break out. And that's going to change the entire right. nature of what is going to happen in West Asia. Whether it will lead to a nuclear exchange, Iran does not have nuclear weapons, but it's also true that using dirty bombs could be something which would also cause enough damage if Israel wants to use nuclear weapons. What will be the role of Russia? What's the role of China going to be? So all these are questions. 
And I do think the fact that the United States is trying to say that it is trying to, you know, getting pulling back Israel, but Israel is not listening. That's not the full picture. But nevertheless, is at the moment United States thinking that if it really spins out of our hands, if there's a full fledged war between Israel, Iran, and all the other countries that we have talked about who might also then be involved, what's going to happen to the global supply of oil? What's going to happen to the region? And what are the long term implications for the global economy? If this really happens, if this really happens, countries like India are going to be in an right. extremely bad position because you're much more dependent on West Asian oil, even remittances than other countries are. And it's unfortunate that the Indian government has taken a role which is not simply of being a neutral player, but also allowing certain kinds of material, military supplies to go to Israel, uh, not being willing to open its uh, mouth, talk about what is really an unjust war and particularly the kind of genocidal violence. The fact that India is abstaining on all of that in the United Nations doesn't speak well of India's foreign policy. We can spend another day on what is the difference between non-alignment and multiple alignments as our foreign minister seems to be talking about. But I think this is a test that we should show that multiple alignments and non-alignments are completely different things and one has a moral compass and this one doesn't. One has self-interest of the nation which is in a, with aligned to a larger strategic vision. The multi-alignments simply believes that, uh, you know, the old policy of your enemies' enemies is my friend is actually good enough for today's world. It is not. And I think that's a discussion we can have for the future. At the moment, the heart goes out to the Palestinian people and the kind of battles that are taking place both in Gaza and Lebanon and also on the attacks in the West Bank, which is really another one which is under the radar at the moment, but which is also now being stepped up. So all these things are something we have to watch. The world is in a very dangerous you know, position at the moment, at a tipping point in which either we will have a conflagration of a kind we have not thought of, or we might get, might get better counsel prevail. And the United States and its Western allies, Germany, France and England, might show some spine and some independence, though at the moment the hopes are not very bright. Right. So that's where we are at the moment. Thank you so much, Prabhu. So on that note, we'll end this discussion on the situation in West Asia. We'll be tracking this issue closely in future videos as well. Until then, keep watching News Click.